Here we go. Um, you know, Pastor has been speaking about how the spring and the fall feast um, have been fulfilled. You know, that um, most Messianic Jews believe that um, the fall feast haven't, all the fall feasts haven't been fulfilled yet because, you know, of Christ's coming, his second coming. Um, and then um, your traditional Jews don't believe that they've all been fulfilled. So, with that being said, Pastor has been ministering, showing you guys how the spring feast and the fall feast do um, connect with each other. Um, and they have been fulfilled just through Christ's first coming. Everything in the Word we know points to Jesus Christ. Everything that has a meaning. You know, which everything in the Word has a meaning. And that meaning is Jesus Christ, is Yeshua. And all of these feasts point to Him. Um, now, Carl, can you pull up that um, that one page for me? <laughs> I did get one page. Um, okay, so you guys who are here on Saturdays, you, I mean Wednesdays, you know this is in that Edward Chumney book, and Pastor had talked about this, about how the civil calendar, that was the time, that was the, the months and and the way the calendar was before God changed it in the book of Exodus when the children of Israel were in Egypt. It's very important for us to understand these calendars before you can go forward and understand the feast. God changed the time when the children were in captivity in Egypt. That was in this calendar, number seven. It was the seventh month. It was Nisan, okay? That is when the children of Israel um, were told to, you know, do the Passover, okay? And as God's instructing them how to do the Passover, he says, now look, Moses, no longer is this going to be the seventh month for you. This is going to be the first month. So you move over to the religious calendar and you see that Nisan has been moved to the first month, okay? Now, the civil calendar, you see where Nisan is, number 7 through 12? What they did was, you see 7 through 12, has now, in the changing of time, become 1 through 6. You see? Do you all understand? Shake yes or no, so I know if you guys got it. Okay. All right, now, something um, that I didn't realize, and God just showed it to me through Pastor and I having a discussion last night and me going over this sermon with him, because I always want to check myself because he's a walking Bible, so I want to see if I'm in error in some way. And, um, you know, I guess because of mindset and where we live, you know, we think January through December, okay, the first month's winter, then you kind of get into spring, then you get in. And that's how I was looking at this calendar. So I was thinking, oh, the children of Israel, the seventh month of Nisan, that's kind of around fall time. Oh, they left in the fall, but not so. Um, I'm not going to go into it because that would take me down a whole nother road, but according to scripture and pastor could explain it to you more in depth according to scripture we know that Adam fell that's why it's called the fall he fell in the month of Tishri Tishri their calendar and this civil calendar it began in the fall so that's your fall months moving through winter see Keslev that's winter months and um, which would be around our December time. So it's like fall goes into winter, and then when they get down to Nissan, the seventh month, they're in their springtime, okay? And then God says, you know what? This springtime's not going to be the seventh month for you guys anymore. We're going to start the new calendar. It's going to be the first month, the beginning of months. It, right? That's when he right. flipped it. And so this calendar here begins in the spring. And you see, if you want to look at it even deeper, on a deeper level, 
You see Tishri in the civil calendar, and I told you guys that starts in the fall time, right? It's when Adam fell. And then over here in this calendar, after God changed the time, it's the season of Nisan, the season of where Yeshua was the Passover lamb and made a way for us. He restored it. Here the first Adam failed. Here the second Adam prevailed. Do you guys understand that? So it's important to understand this calendar. When, if you want to remember, when did God change the time? Think of Egypt, the book of Exodus, when they were in bondage and captivity and God was setting them free and instituted the Passover. That is when time changed. The calendar changed from that time. Now, so the new sign would be like April? Yes, March, April. They're springtime. Um, and realize too, I don't want to get you guys confused. Our months go from the 1st to the 30th. In this religious calendar, uh, Nissan, he said it's going to be the beginning of months from you. Their calendar goes like the middle of the year. I mean the middle of the month, like the 14th, 15th to the 14th, 15th of the next month. Um, so as long as you understand that, then it's easy to understand, you know, to start comprehending things of the feast. And if you look at number seven on both, right, right there, Nisan and, and Tishri, right, that's where God changed it. You see, so Nisan's up at the top. No longer was Tishri first. Tishri became the seventh month. He flipped and changed the times there. And um, so now we are operating in this religious calendar according to the Jewish uh, ways, the biblical ways, and their calendar does not begin in the winter, it begins in the spring. You know how pastor talks about spring and resurrection in the spring and he believes that's when the Lord's going to return is in the spring because you know everything began and we were set free in the spring through what Yeshua did. And so since we understand that I want to show you guys how, like when pastors talk, and I know it's a lot to comprehend, um, and, and I'm kind of just simple, so I'm hoping this kind of helps you guys. Um, um, on Passover, we know, I'm going to give you guys a date, okay? Let's, let's do this. Yes? If you, if you save them in your bookmarks, we could log in here and show you images. Did that way. I saved it in the Citadel Hope. Oh, but I saved it under that star. I didn't. S yeah, it's in the Citadel Hope. See if they in there. I mean the Citadel Storehouse. I'm sorry. Yeah. They not there. It was crazy me trying to work with the computer. I was like, no, mm -mm, I'm just gonna stay focused. Um, okay, quick review. Spring feast or Passover. You might want to write it down. Passover. Unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost. Your fall feast. Feast of trumpets, also known as Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur, K I P P U R, means Day of Atonement. Feast of Tabernacles. The last great day or eighth day. Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur, Feast of Tabernacles, and the last great day, also known as the eighth day. Okay. Passover occurred on Nisan 14. It's important for you guys to write these dates down if you take a note so you'll understand how they correlate together, okay? Passover was Nisan 14, or Nisan. Unleavened bread was Nisan 15 through the 21st. First fruits was Nisan 17. Pentecost was 50 days after Passover. <laughs> um, Rosh Hashanah or Feast of Trumpets was on Tishri 1 T-I-S-H-R-E-I Tishri 1 
Okay, Yom Kippur was on Tishri 10. The Feast of Tabernacles was on Tishri 15 through the 21st. And then the last day or the eighth day was on Tishri 22nd. Okay, why is it important to know about these feasts and their dates? One, because God wrote it in His Word and anything He writes in His Word is important. Um, but it also shows us how we can mirror the, fall, the spring feast and the fall feast from each other. They're a mirror image of each other and how they fulfill each other. Um, and, you know, Jesus fulfills them all any kind of way you want to look at it, all right? Um, and like Pastor said, Satan was expecting the Messiah to come during the fall, during the time of Yom Kippur, when they were making atonement for the sins, for the nation, for the people of Israel. Um, that's what he was expecting because he knows the feast. That's what he was expecting. But you see, he seeks to change the times and the season. Well, God's the author of that. So he just beat him at his own game, is what he did. He changed it in Egypt. He said, Nisan is now the beginning of months for you. And little did Satan know that that is where the Savior of the world was going to come. He was not going to come in the fall feast. He was not going to come at Yom Kippur to... Um, you know, to set the captives free, so to speak. So, um, we looked at God's calendar. We understand how it works, that, he, that God changed the time. And so now we want to look at the feast and how the fall and the spring um, complete each other. Okay, so if you look at Yom Kippur, and you wrote it down in your notes, right? In Yom Kippur, that was on the 10th day of Tishri, okay? What happened on the 10th day of Nisan. Now, I want y'all to understand. We're going to be jumping back and forth, but in order. So I want you to understand. I'm showing you this date in the fall. I'm showing you this date in the spring and how they connect. Okay? So you have the spring feast, because now we're done with this calendar. We're in this calendar. Okay? We got the spring feast, Nisan 10. Okay? Then over here, we have the date Tishri 10. All right? What happened on Tishri 10? Nisan 10, we know that God tells us in the book of Exodus um, that they were to take a lamb into the house, okay? And that they it was to be of the first year, right? When they're in Egypt, it's the, he's instituting and giving instructions for the first Passover, okay? In Exodus 12. Take a lamb into your house to be without blemish and of the first year. Keep it in your house for four days. On the 14th day, they take it outside the house and they kill it and they put the blood on the doorpost and the lentils. You guys know that, okay? So on what happened on um, this happened on Nisan 10 when they are to take the lamb into their house okay you guys got that right Nisan 10 we're talking about the spring we're back in the Old Testament in Exodus take a lamb into your house what happened in the New Testament what happened with Jesus on Nisan 10 well, according to the scriptures, it says that that was Jesus' triumphal entry. He came riding in on a colt on Nisan 10. What did he do? He did the same thing that they did in Nisan 10 in Exodus, in Egypt. What? He was the Lamb of God, correct? Take a lamb into your house. What did he do? The Lamb of God, Jesus, who was without spot, without blemish, and was the first begotten of the Father, is the same picture of Nisan 10 when they're taking a lamb into their house of the first year without spot and blemish, right? And they were commanded to inspect it and to search it to and examine it to make sure it was without blemish because it was going to be an offering, okay? So what happens in the New Testament in Nisan 10? Yeshua, Jesus, the Lamb of God, comes riding in, right? 
He is without sin. He's the Lamb, and He's the first begotten. He fulfills everything of the Lamb in the Old Testament, okay? So you see in a picture of the spring and fall time and the exact dates, how they coincide with each other, how they mirror each other. He's fulfilling something, even though the times were changed between Tishri and Nisan. Both of these things are happening in the month of Tishri, and then you have a picture of it in the, in the month of Nisan. The exact same thing, okay? So then, something that's interesting to know, okay, Yom Kippur is on the 10th day of Tishri, right? Okay, Jesus comes in and enters in Jerusalem riding on a donkey, right, on Nisan 10. What does he do? He goes straight to his father's house. Over here in Exodus, they're taking that lamb without spot and wrinkle and bringing it in the house. Jesus comes riding in on the donkey, Nisan 10. He goes straight to his father's house. And what happens? He's inspected. He's examined. He's questioned by the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. He's being inspected. The Lamb of God, just like the Lamb over here that was taken into house on Nisan 10. Exact picture. Okay? On Yom Kippur, they were commanded that um, it's also called the Day of Atonement. They also call it the day, this is very interesting, the day of face to face. Okay? It's the one day a year that the priest could enter the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant is, okay? And he can sprinkle the blood offering upon the mercy seat. They were face to face with God. It was one time a year. They tried going in there any other time when the Ark was there, dead. So, only on Yom Kippur, even till this day, you ever read books, or if you have this Chumney book, he's a Messianic Jew, he believes in Jesus, but out of respect for Jews that he's hoping will read this book, he does the same practice, like when he writes the word God, it's G-D. Like they won't spell it all out, they won't say the name of God. One day a year, his name was allowed to be spoken. And that was on Yom Kippur, Tishri 10, the Day of Atonement. Okay? One day a year. In Hebrew, it's called yod Hey vav Hey. Y'all have heard past a minister that before. Okay? What does that mean in English? It means, I am becoming who I am becoming. <clears throat> That's God's name. I am becoming who I am becoming. They shorten it because they don't speak God's name, right? So they, they put just the, I guess you would call it initials, they'll put Y-H-V-H, yod Hey vav Hey. We say, I am that I am. We shorten it to that, okay? But they only do speak His name on Yom Kippur, okay? This blew me away. That's Tishri 10. Over here, Nisan 10 now, we're looking at with Jesus in the temple, right? Being examined, being inspected, right? Just like the lamb in Exodus, okay? He's in the temple, in his father's house, preaching and ministering. And on the Day of Atonement, the day of Yom Kippur, the day known as Face to Face, He's in the temple in the spring feast of Nisan 10, okay, face to face with his chosen people Israel, and they don't even know it. In the Father's house, face to face. Then, when you back up and you think, okay, he's making that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, what are they doing? They taking palm branches and laying them out before him and, and praising him, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Oh, save. What are they doing? What are they doing? My God, my hair on my legs that I didn't shave is standing up. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I told you I was created for a sense of humor. Look at my mother-in-law. It's all right. You want cold rag? All right. Um, I'm serious, guys. This blows me away. They laying down these palm branches. Jesus is riding in. Yeshua is riding in. His Hebrew name, Yeshua, means salvation. They're saying the name of God when they're calling him Hosanna. Hosanna means please save, salvation, savior. Yeshua, salvation, is riding in. They don't even realize it. When they say in Hosanna, the name Hosanna means savior. Save us, we pray thee, salvation. Go look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Yeshua's name means salvation. So in essence, what are they saying? Yeshua, save us. Messiah, save us. Savior, save us. A picture of how even in Nisan 10, the Passover spring feast, he fulfills Tishri. He's fulfilling the fall feast in the spring feast. Yom Kippur is a fall feast. Yom Kippur is when they're face to face, when they're crying out for salvation. He's doing it all in his triumphal entry on the Nisan 10. Had God, think about this, had God not changed the months, it would have been the same time. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Nisan and Tishri go hand in hand. Look at them. There they are. Number seven, number one. I mean, they're right there. Your spring and your fall feast. He's standing right there in front of them, face to face. The only day they're allowed to speak his name, they don't realize it because they're in the spring feast. But he's fulfilling the fall, calling out for salvation, and he's there. Um, well, gosh, I covered a lot right there. Um, I, got a, I got a little excited. Um, what was Nissan 10. You just mentioned 7. Can I share something? Right here, if you look up on the thing, if y'all could hold it to the end, not being disrespectful, but I'm totally different than Pastor. I can't take questions in the middle or I lose my train of thought. But I will be more than glad to talk afterwards, so I got to keep going. Um, okay, so then we move on, all right, to Nissan 14. What happened on Nisan 14, okay? First, we're going to look at Jesus. What was going on in Nisan 14 with Jesus, okay, in the New Testament? On Nisan 14, that is the Feast of Passover, okay? Yeshua is celebrating the Passover with his disciple on Nisan 14. He goes to the garden to pray. He hears the people of Israel on their rooftops singing their Hallels at midnight from Psalms 118. And in that psalm, it's crying, it's calling out and crying and saying how merciful God is and praying for salvation to come. And there he is walking down their dirt cobblestone streets. Salvation, light of the world, walk into the garden to go and pray before the Father and ask Him to please let this cup of affliction pass from me, but not my will, your will. He's going, and then, let me tell you, this is commanded, commanded that they do these things and they go up on their rooftops. And you got to realize, Jews that were all over in the area, this isn't just the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This was a feast. There's three feasts that God says that you have to make pilgrimage back to Jerusalem, right? And this was one of them, Passover. So you've got probably millions or a million. You've got a lot of Jews making pilgrimage coming here, right? And people hosting Passover and inns full and people's houses full. And I mean, they're along the countryside. They're everywhere. And then for their feast, they go and they sing Hallel's. I don't want to give you the wrong psalms. I don't know if it's Psalm 115 through 118, but it's like two or three psalms. For sure, it's Psalms 118 that they sing during their feasts, okay? And they are singing on their rooftops asking for salvation 
begging for salvation to come and he's in their midst. He's walking between their houses watching them as he's on his way to the garden, the salvation. He was there, okay? So all of this is going on in, on the sign 14, okay, the Passover. Now, what I want you to understand, okay, get out of the mindset of the day and age we live in, okay? Our days go from, we say, you know, a day's from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. It's not how it works in the Jewish calendar. It's from sundown to sundown. So when they break it down, they roughly say from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. is their days, okay? So, a lot of people question, well, wait a minute, how could Jesus celebrate the Passover and be the atoning lamb, you know, the Passover lamb? Well, because he celebrated the Passover, they, it started on, um, you know, 6 p.m. in the evening, went to, to the next day. Um, also, during the time of Christ, um, they have rules that if... If the holiday or the feast happens to fall on their Sabbath, it's extended another day. So there's a lot of Jewish history, traditions, laws, and things that you need to understand, you know, to see why, okay, wait, how could he do this? So in his time, you had from Nisan 14 into the following day is where they celebrated. You see, they celebrated their personal, um, how should I say, they'd bring their own offering to the temple, okay, for, for the Passover. But then the priest himself, the high priest, he did a Passover offering for the nation as a whole, okay? And so you have Yeshua at 6 p.m., okay? It started on Nisan 14. I'm trying to get this so you guys will understand. The next day is Nisan 15, right? But Passover is Nisan 14 at 6 p.m. until Nisan 15, 6 p.m., okay? Um, but they would carry it until actually midnight that night. But God is very precise. So Yeshua celebrated Passover. I'm going to break it down. You know, well, what scripture it says that? I'm just breaking it down because it's too much to get into. He celebrated it from 6 p.m. to midnight. Midnight, he's on his way to the garden, okay? And he hears him singing the Hallel's. We know he's secretly taken, right? Because we're still in the sign 14, even though it's after midnight. We, it, it goes all the way until 6 p.m. The sign 15, technically, is still the 14th of Nissan. Right. Did I lose you? Y'all, you got it. Okay, so at midnight... He goes to the garden, he's praying, he's asking God to let this cup pass from him. He's not being poetic. He's talking about a literal cup in Passover, the cup of affliction. It's the same cup back in Israel that represented all the plagues that fell upon Israel. And what was one of those plagues? Death of the firstborn son. Here you got the Lamb of God, the first, the only begotten son of the Father. He's asking that that cup pass from him, but not his will, the Father's will, okay? Judas comes in, betrays him, and then you know the journey Jesus goes on, taken before the Sanhedrin and Herod and Pilate, and we know that, that story, okay? All of this is still going on on Nisan 14, okay? And then Jesus is crucified. He's hung on the cross, okay? Um, 9 a.m., I believe? at 9 a.m., and we know he dies at 3, a, uh, 3 p.m. Um, then they take him down from the cross, and they're hurrying to get him into the tomb, because you know when you read, and they wanted to come, they wanted to anoint the body, they wanted to do this, but you know, the Sabbath is beginning, and okay. Well, what's getting ready to happen is they're approaching that, that the end of Passover, that Nisan 14, uh, 15 at 6 p.m. They're coming out of that Nisan 14 Passover date and entering in the Nisan 15, which begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And they definitely, because of their laws, cannot be handling any dead body. or So they have to get him buried, okay? So we see that that's going on all on the sign 14, okay? Um, now, 
God, I want to go off on something, but I'm not. Um, in Exodus on Nisan 14, we know that that lamb in Egypt, right, was taken out the house and then they killed it and they crucified it and put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. We know that is symbolic to the blood of Christ, the thorn of crowns, Yeshua on the cross, you know, the wood, the lintel, the doorpost, if you line it up with a door, right, the cross and a door. So that's the picture of Yeshua. We know that, okay, that he fulfilled it. Now, with all that being said, we want to look at Tishri 14, right? Because we're trying to show how do these spring feasts and these fall feasts mirror each other? How do they fulfill each other? Well, on Tishri 14 in the fall, there is no feast, right? So how does Jesus fulfill it? We know on the 15th of Tishri begins the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, let me tell you what they were doing on Tishri 14. On Tishri 14, they were busy getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles. They were... <laughs> love this. They, <laughs> they were getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles and they were building their sukkahs, their booths, their tabernacles. Their, these are all the definitions for it in Hebrew. Their temporary dwelling place. Okay, And God commands them to do this. You can find all of this stuff in Leviticus 16 mm -hmm. and in, um, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 16 and Leviticus 23 verses 33 through 44. Okay? Um, so they are preparing for the Feast of Tabernacles. God commands them and instructs them to construct their sukkahs. Okay? All of this is to be done by Tishri 14 because on the 15th they're going to they're going to start their Feast of Tabernacles. So on the 14th, they're constructing their sukkahs, and God gave them specific instructions how to construct it. They, it was supposed to be thatched on three sides. The front was to be open, um, which is like wel welcoming a way in. And then the roof was to be thatched like this, so that when you dwelled, you were commanded to live in the sukkah for seven days. So that when you were in it, you could look up to the heavens and you could see the stars. Um, and so God had instructed them to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles and he told them not only to have their sukkahs build, basically, but that um, they needed to finish gathering in from their threshing floor and their wine vats, okay? Because not only does this point to Christ, you know, and that it's a religious feast, this is also the time of um, harvest feast. You know, in the, um, you had harvest in the spring and then they had harvest that they did in the fall. So he tells them to collect the rest of their grain and bring things in from the threshing floor and the wine vats, okay? Feast of Tabernacles is also known as the Feast of Ingathering and the Feast of Dedication. Today, people call Hanukkah, uh, it's, it's also known as the Festival of Lights. Today, people call Hanukkah the Festival of Lights because of the menorah. I'm not even going there. But the reason it was called the Festival of Lights here was because it says even in um, rabbinical like teachings, in their traditions, in their oral law, when you read it, it talks about how um, rabbis and sages and scribes from umpteen years ago, you have never seen a celebration like this celebration. Why? Because it was the only feast, Feast of Tabernacles, that God commanded us to rejoice. He uses the word celebrate in the other feasts. But in this particular Feast of Tabernacles, he tells us to rejoice, commanded to rejoice. Why? There's got to be a deeper reason. Well, we know that they, they're rejoicing. Did it go off? Did we know they were... Did it go off, guys, or can you hear me? It's on? Hello? It's on? Hello. Went low. Um... I don't know. Can it be turned up? Because it's recording. I want to make sure you can hear. Okay. 
Stay. Um, they didn't put a hair clip on there. Um, so when they're bringing their harvest in from the threshing floor and they're bringing their things in from the wine vat, it made me go look at a threshing floor and a wine vat, like in Hebrew and the Strong Concordance. What does it mean? So as I'm studying, um, I'm like, wow, like that just blew me away, right? Because we're trying to line up now the Feast of Tabernacles that's from Tishri 15 to the 21st to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Nisan 15 through the 21st. How do they mirror each other? So I'm like, but wait, Lord, Passover's got to fit in there somewhere, you know? And I'm like, that was on Nisan 14. There's got to be something on Tishri 14. So then when I went back and I read, like in Leviticus, I started seeing that God was telling them by the 14th, you know, this stuff has to be done, and that Tabernacles actually started 6 p.m. on the sign 14. I'm like, okay, I'm seeing the correlation. Well, when you look at the threshing floor, God's got them doing this on the sign 14. How does it line up with Passover? What happened at Passover? Jesus was right, beaten, crucified, died, buried, correct? You look at Tishri 14, God says, gather in, go to the wine vats, gather in, go to the threshing floor, get your, you get your grain, your harvest, there it is, um, gather it in. So I went and I looked up the threshing floor, which I knew what it was, but never correlated it with Passover. It's literally, I went and looked up ancient ones from Israel, literally like a, a circular floor in the stone where they tread it out with like oxen or animals or poles and what do they do to the harvest to the wheat or the barley they beat it these are the terms they use they beat it they bruise it they crush it this was what God told them to do on Tishri 14 go get the stuff from the threshing floor that on Tishri 14, Nisan 14, Jesus was bruised, battered, crushed. Okay? So you've got the same picture there, okay? And wheat and barley, you know, you want to look at it a little bit deeper? It's the same thing that you make the bread from, right? Here you've got the bread of life being very same thing being done to him that was done on the threshing floor in the fall feast. So then you look at the wine vat. Uh, in the Strong Concordance, Greek 3025, it was a trough for a wine press. Usually in ancient times, a trough or hollowed out rock where the wine could run down into it after it had been bruised and stomped upon. God tells them on Tishri 14 before Feast of Tabernacles, Go get from your threshing floor and your wine vat. Wow. Go get all your produce and your grapes, things that have been crushed and bruised and battered. Collect it and bring it in. And then build your sukkah, a dwelling place. Start making a temporary dwelling. They do that on the sign for, on, on Tishri 14. Isn't it something that Yeshua on the sign 14 was wrapped in a white linen and placed in a cave. Something that has a top and three sides with the opening in the front. A temporary, because the grave didn't hold him. It was a temporary dwelling place. Nisan 14. Same thing as what was going on in the fall feast on Tishri 14 that God was instructing them to do. Then they start their Feast of Tabernacles. They live in their shelters and their booths for seven days. Um, there's so much in that feast, but that's what, what Joseph is teaching on Wednesday night, so I'm not going into all the elements and stuff. What I'm trying to show you is what Joseph has been ministering. I hope I'm putting it on a little bit of simpler level to see how they literally do. Can somebody kick the air on? It's getting warm in here. Um, how the um, feast are a mirror image and that he fulfilled them all. Okay, so in the Psalm 15, 
um, through the 21st, we know that's called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay, right after Passover. It starts the day after Passover. The Jews call it their season of their freedom, okay? Then from Tishri 15 through the 21st in the fall, you have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is known as the seizing of our rejoicing. Okay? So, how do these two correlate? Well, when you look at unleavened bread in Exodus 12, 15 through 20, um, you see that the reason they're celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread back in in the Old Testament, when, you know, wilderness, Egypt, they, they doing all these things. It commemorates the provision of the Lord's provi his provision for blah. it commemorates the Lord making provision while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. When they ate manna from heaven, which we know in Hebrew manna translates man, Jesus was the bread of life, right? So they were feasting on the man in heaven in the wilderness, okay? They were um, they were celebrating the feast of unleavened bread, remembering how God made provision for them with the manna in the wilderness and how they were set free from bondage in Egypt. Okay? Seven days. Now, when you read what did God command them to do, it says, and this this like blew me away. I'm like, Lord, there's something there. Seven days they were commanded to eat no leaven. So they celebrated Passover and they left Egypt. And then God told them for seven days, do not eat any leaven. If you are found eating leaven in those seven days, God says, put him away from the people of Israel. Then he comes back two sentences down and repeats it again. He's establishing something. He said it twice within four scriptures. This time he says, if they're found eating leaven, cut that soul off from the land of Israel. That's serious. Now, you don't get a lot of description in the Bible as far as, you know, there's so many elements like on Passover that they do. This is what we have for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We know during this feast, this spring feast, that on it starts on the 15th and ends on the 21st, and we know on the 17th is when they start their feast. It's called the Feast of First Fruits. They begin gathering in their harvest. They bring their stuff before the priest. The priest takes their sheave of grain and he waves it uh, in the temple before the Lord, symbol symbolizing that, um, Lord, this is yours and all the harvest to come after this. It all belongs to you. Okay? We know that Yeshua died on the 14th, that he was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits on the 17th. He took his sacrifice, his blood offering, went to heaven, stood before the Father, and waved it. Lord, all of these belong to me. And he, whoo, my hair stand up. All of these belong to me. He fulfilled it. When he rose from the dead, he didn't look like the Jesus that walked with the disciples. Right? Y'all have heard pastor minister before how Adam looked like a twin of Yeshua, right? Of God when they walked in the garden together, right? Well, when Jesus came, he didn't look like his first state. He came in a flesh tent. He was born in a sukkah, a tabernacle. God says this is our temple, right? A tabernacle, a temple, a temporary dwelling place he was born in. But when he rose from the dead during the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 17th, which they call First Fruits, and he waved his blood before the Father and said, Lord, all of these belong to me. What did he put on? He got his new body. He got his new tabernacle. He got his new tent. All of that going on, Nisan 15 through the 21st. So how does Tishri 15 through the 21st add up? Feast of Tabernacles. It's all about the tent. It's all about the, it's all about the tabernacle. It's all about gathering in the fruit. Gathering it in from the wine vat. 
gathering it in from the threshing floor, building yourself a sukkah and temporary dwelling in it, just like Yeshua temporarily dwelled in the um, tomb and then rose from the dead and got his new tabernacle, his new tent. And guess what? All those that the Gospels talk about, the first fruits, the first fruits that rose with him on the feast, the first fruits, during the, the festival of unleavened bread in that seven day period, they got their new bodies as well, walking around the streets. It's in the Gospels, I think Matthew. It's all about the tabernacle and the tent, but it goes even further than that. How does he, how does he fulfill it? First and foremost, very, very simple. Jesus was our bread of life. He was a man without sin. We know in the scriptures, especially when God's fussing at the Pharisees and Sadducees, or when he's telling stories, he talks about leaven and how he says leaven, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Leaven, we know, was symbolic to sin. Okay? He was without sin. He was that unleavened bread. I mean... And you could stop there. You don't need to go any further than that, technically, you know. But he fulfilled it. And so then you have it over here in Tabernacles. Not only um, is the tabernacle itself a picture of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ, because think about it. It's, it doesn't have four sides. It's got three sides, a picture of the Godhead right? And then in the top it's thatched and open so that you can see into the stars which speaks of a connection between man and God. Dwelling in a temporary dwelling place. Yeshua was not born in our cute little manger scenes that we put up on the lawn. Sorry. He wasn't. He wasn't even laid in the cute little wooden thing. No. Go look it up on Google. Ancient feeding troughs were stones that were hollowed out. Sounds like that wine vat, doesn't it? The rock that's hollowed out so that the juice and the wine can run down into it. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus was the rock in the wilderness that Moses hit. The grapes is just the spirit. The grapes is the blood of Yeshua. Every element points to Jesus Christ. Every element. That sukkah itself was representative of the Godhead and the connection between man and God. And then Jesus came and the scripture tells us that the Word was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh, and He came and He dwelt, or in Hebrew, tabernacled amongst us. Yeshua, and you can do the simple math, go back and read it, like with, with Elizabeth having John, and you can go read it and, and figure it out, but trust me, it's there. It's a whole nother sermon. Yeshua was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. He came and he dwelt with us. He tabernacled with us. And he was born and laid in a hewn out rock, a feeding trough, the rock of our salvation, laying in that rock, a place of feeding where the animals fed. I mean, yikes. The bread of life in that feeding trough. Remember I told you the Feast of Tabernacles was also known as the Festival of Lights because um, I'm going to have it for Wednesday. I'm going to try to have it for Wednesday and show you guys some pictures. I mean, like, rejoicing like you wouldn't believe. I mean, they went through thousands of gallons of oil for these hellacious lamps that they had, like, in the courtyards and stuff like that. And guess what? They're singing Psalms 118 to the Hillel, crying out for salvation. And there he is, laying in a feeding trough. Here I am. How did those wise men know about Yeshua? I'm going to give you my personal opinion. I think they were Jews. I think they understood 
looking at the stars because in Feast of Tabernacles that was one of the main elements that you were to look into the heavenlies. That roof could not be closed that you made your sukkah or your tabernacle. And they saw his star. Abraham was taken outside to see the star. That's right. That's right. Abraham was taken out to see the stars. And, and, and that's how they, they lived their lives, you know, according to the seasons and stuff like that and times. But you have a picture of Yeshua coming. I mean, God's so precise. Coming, being born, the word tells us he came and dwelt and tabernacled amongst us in a temporary dwelling place because his whole purpose was to go to the cross. This was just a temporary thing for him. And not only was he in a tabernacle, but he was literally in a tabernacle. Whether it was a cave in the field, or it was a sukkah, a booth, because all those pilgrims, that's another feast that they were commanded, you make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Millions of Jews making pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You have a census going on. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. That whole area is just consumed with people. Okay? And you have Yeshua being born in this, this tabernacle, dwelling amongst us, so that, um, you know, he could lay his life down for us. I mean, it's so perfectly clear how he fulfills all of the feasts, the spring and the fall. So you go past this Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you go past the Feast of Tabernacles, it come, brings you to the last feast. They call it that last great day or the eighth day. Okay, It was on Tishri 22. In John 7, verse 37 and 38, Jesus is in the temple, and he speaks, and he's telling the people... Um, Come to me, any of you all who thirst, I will give you living water that will flow from out of your belly. And it says it right there, I think in verse 38, or it might be 39, but it says that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit to come. Why did he speak that at that particular moment? What was going on? What was he looking at? Well, it tells us in that verse that he was at the feast the last great day. So let's look and see what goes on in the last great day. And um, this is going to like knock your socks off and tell you what they do. Yeah, because this is they're going to blow them off. Hold on. Each day out of the temple, there was a special ceremony. Priests were divided into three divisions. Think spiritually now, okay? The first division were the priests on duty for the festival, um, and a group of pe okay a group of priests went out the eastern gate of the temple and went to the Mosat Valley, where the ashes were dumped at the beginning of the Sabbath. Then they would cut down willows. The willows had to be 25 feet in length. That's a long willow branch, okay. After this, they would form a line this way, horizontally, with the priests holding the willows. About 25 or 30 feet behind this row of priests holding 25-foot willows was 30 feet up ahead, another row of priests with 25-foot willows. Okay? This is all going on, Feast of Tabernacles, around the last great day. Okay, that we're talking about. Where Jesus is talking about, come to me and I will give you water, you know, drink that you know not of. It'll flow out of your living water, out of your belly. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? He's talking about it at this time, what I'm reading to you. Okay, remember that. About 25 or 30 feet behind this row of priests, allowing room for the willows, would be another row of priests with willows. So there would be row after row after row of these 25-foot willows and priests. The whole road back to the temple was lined with pilgrims as they went to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival as they were commanded by God to do. There... There would be a signal, and the priest would step out with their left foot, and then step, they would step out like this with their left foot. 
and then step to the right. So they would, they'd step and they'd go like to the sides, like this, okay? Swinging 25 foot, imagine, willows back and forth. 25 foot, like from me to Carolyn. 25 foot willows swinging that back and forth, row after row. Meanwhile, a third group of priests headed by the high priest went out the gate known as the water gate. Yeah. Now, remember, this stuff is speaking of the eighth day, the last great day where they did what they called a water libation ceremony. Okay? Then um, they went out known as the water gate. They had gone to the pool known as Salome. Okay, which means gently flowing waters. There, the high priest had a golden vase and he drew the water known as the living water. When the high priest drew the water from the pool of Siloam during this eighth day, last great day, it was known as living water. Yeshua is sitting in the temple, it tells you in John 7, and he's there on the last great day and he's telling you if you're thirsty come and drink I'm going to give you living water that flows out of your belly speaking of the Holy Spirit at the same time this is going on the high priest drew, getting the wa water from the pool of Siloam that's called you know living water and he's drawing it out in this golden vase um, he held it in the vase his assistant held a silver vase containing wine silver redemption wine the blood of Yeshua you can't get the spirit unless you come through the death and burial and resurrection of Yeshua just as the priests in the valley began to march toward Jerusalem, so did the priests in Siloam. As they marched towards the city of Jerusalem, I want y'all to picture this, okay? I don't want to lose you. Just picture this in your mind. The willows made a swishing sound in the wind as they approached the city. You've got, picture a row of priests from that wall to this wall. Each one of these priests have a 25-foot willow. Then you've got another row of priests like that with 25-foot willows and another row of priests. Can you imagine what that sounded like when they were swishing those 25-foot long... I'll tell you what it sounded like, a mighty Russian wind. That's exactly what it sounded like. Um, as they approached the city, the willows made a swishing sound in the wind. The word wind in Hebrew is ruach which is the word for spirit. Therefore, this ceremony was symbolic or representative of the Holy Spirit of God coming upon the city of Jerusalem. So, at this time, huh, wait, 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 I gotta read you this. This procession that's going on, guess who it's led by? A flute player. Hmm, why is that so special? just so happens that this flute player is called the pierced one. Mm. Okay? The pierced one leads the procession and blows the call for the wind and the water to enter the temple. Oh, wow. He fulfills it all. Um, and, I mean, it's just amazing because the women there are singing, they're around the altar, and the people start singing the song, saying, with joy, we will draw water out of the well of salvation. And there is their salvation sitting right there in the temple saying, hello, here I am. See all of that? That's me. All of that, that's me but they didn't have eyes to see. Our prayer is that they'll have eyes to see because then they'll be able to teach us stuff that we couldn't even fathom. I mean, just look at this stuff here. Is that like not amazing? And it's all about the giving of the Spirit. You know, you know what's even crazier than that? You know, they have um, laws concerning circumcision. And it has to be eight days after the child is born. They're to be brought to the temple and circumcised. 
Yeshua was born on the Feast of Tabernacles, where he came and dwelt in a sukkah, a temporary dwelling place, on the first day of the feast. The feast goes for seven days, and then you have the eighth, last great day, what I just read to you about the willows, about the Spirit of God, about the Holy Spirit. And guess who's at the temple being circumcised? On the eighth day, the last great day, the number of new beginnings. Want to talk about their season of rejoicing and their season of freedom? It's in Yeshua. All the ceremonies speak of him. He fulfills the spring and the fall. They are a mirror image of each other. I hope you guys understand that. And I hope I, you know, look, Tess is like, give me more. I hope you guys understand that. I hope I was simple enough. But, um, I, you know, I, I, I was just so blown away. Um, Zechariah was happy because yesterday my, my, I've been studying for three days, but yesterday I studied from um, um, 8 o'clock till exactly 3 o'clock. And, uh, we started to homeschool at three, so he just had to review math. That was his big homeschooling day. He was like so disappointed. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, guys, that's why, you know, it's important for us. And, and I'm going to say something, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. It's between you and the Lord. But once again, I'm going to reiterate. If God is so specific in his dates, in his times, in every action that they do in their ceremonies, everything focus and points towards him, right? And, and then he tells us in these feasts that, you know, you got people that say, oh, yeah, we're not under the law, we don't have to do that. Well... Christ came and fulfilled the law, yet you are right. We don't have to do all those things because Christ fulfilled it. However, God does say that these feasts are a statute and commands us to participate in these, a statute forever. Yes. Okay? If he is that specific with the dates he gives us, and that specific to tell us, don't let this season pass by without honoring me. You're not under the law that you got to go cut down your neighbor's willow tree and walk down to, you know. I mean, I'm not saying that, okay? But you have to take the time, not to mention we don't have the money to bail you out. But um, <laughs> when they call the police on you. Um, but you have to take the time to honor it. Yes. Okay? And so the true birth of Christ is not, not December 25th. It is not. Okay? And I am the number one person that used to say... I don't do it for that reason. Well, you know what? I just elevated myself before the Father and His Word and what He told me to do and what not to do. And guess what He tells me not to do? Don't take part in the heathen's practices and traditions. It is an abomination to Him. You know what else was an abomination to Him? Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know what happened to that place. Abomination is strong when God says that. Do not take part in it. If you choose to, you ain't getting no judgment here. I did my part. I pray God set you free. You know, I present the truth. It's between you and the Lord. But, I mean, really think about it. If everything I just ministered on showing you that God says, these are the feasts that I want you to honor as a statute forever... And he gives you the dates, and they line up and co coincide perfectly. And then he says, don't take part in the practices that the heathens do, or their traditions. It's an abomination to him. You show me in the word where Yeshua, where Easter or Christmas or Valentine's Day or Mardi Gras, all of it is of pagan origins. Do a study on your own. If you take part in that, 
You have been presented with the truth. I am not trying to put condemnation. Please hear my heart. I just want God to set you guys free. Amen. You're going to get opposition from your family. Um, and it's going to be hard on you, especially if it's very close and dear to your heart. I used to say, NASA would call from the space station and say, please unplug your lights, we can't sleep. Okay? <laughs> Cheesy Christmas, garland hanging from my ceiling. For two months I walked around with flashing reindeers from my, my body. Okay? I mean, queen of Christmas. Santa's lights went out, he called me. Okay? Seriously. I'm not even kidding. And you know the ministry? Yeah, Mr. Bingle, that was a killer. That was a killer to get rid of Mr. Bingle. That just, that killed me because, and I, I ain't even going to lie. I'm a straight out tell you. I was crying, snot flowing, and I said, Lord, I know you showed me he was a demon, okay? I see it. But he's the cutest demon I've ever seen. I was crying. And I was gently trying to put those plates in a big contractor bag. And God said, break it. Just like that. Just like I said it, break it. I could give it to my mama. I, he said, you want to pass the sin along? Break it. Oh, my God. I, th I said, I laid on the floor in the fetal position. I had so much Christmas stuff. You know the ministry trailer? Two trips to the dump, slap top to the full. To the top, it was filled. That's how much Christmas decoration I had. Till this day, even after the house fire, I go dig in a box and I'm like... I mean, a cupcake top of, like, a you know, Santa Claus. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, it's still popping up, you know? <laughs> but I'm telling you, I was gutted. I was on the floor in the fetal position. Poor Zechariah. He just thought I was dying. He was, Mom, it's going to be okay. And, you know, and Joseph says, I don't understand. I mean, you want to hold on to something that God said you should <laughs> You should have. I'm telling you, I look like something from the Exorcist. <laughs> Get away from me now. Or I will hurt you. <laughs> I was like, yeah, was like hit, no, almost, he almost got green pea soup spit on him. I'm telling you. <laughs> but um, it was rough. And I was, in that, I was in that fetal position. And I cried out to God. And I said, God. I feel gutted. You're killing me. And then I just cried and I composed myself. And then I said, you heard me. I said, you're killing me. He gent gently, gently said, that's the point. Wow. That's all I needed. Crucifying the flesh, stripping away the traditions of men. You know, some of you may be in a position that women may be in a position, you know, that your husbands don't want to give it up. Well, you know what? You got to be working God's divine order and you got to put that in God's hand and God tells you to obey your husband. And then, I like to say sick. You just sick God on him and then, you know, it'll work out. Because then you can stand before the Lord and go, Lord, I'm in right standing. I'm trying to do what you say. It's him. I'm down. I'm obeying you. You said I got to submit to him, you know. That's a nice place to be, submission. But um, <laughs> but my point, I want you guys, I'm only bringing that up because we're approaching those holidays. And on, I believe it's the 17th, I had it written down, but we're approaching um, the true birth of Christ, um, like in a week, okay? Don't, don't let it pass you by. I'm not saying you got to go live out in a sukkah, but, you know, God says it's a statue forever, and it's a time of rejoicing. It will be next weekend. I'm teaching my... Jason knows me well. I, um, it's so fun to put that stuff up, and trick-or-treaters come by and go, wait, why is baby Jesus on the lawn? <laughs> like, they don't understand. But, um, no, because I want to teach my grandkids about a, a sukkah. <laughs> they don't stop. They're like, that woman crazy. Um, 
But I want to teach my grandkids what a sukkah really is and how it points to Christ. I don't want to put them under Levitical law and actions and ceremonies. I want them to know the true birth of Christ, the truth of God's Word. I don't want them to have to grow up and be deprogrammed. It's painful. It's very, very painful. So you guys be in prayer about it and and that's between you and the Lord all I'm saying is he is very specific that we're to take part in these feasts as far as honoring them not letting them pass by and he commands us and gives us instruction in his word not to take part in heathen practices because they're an abomination to him I don't want to do anything that God says, I caused an abomination towards him or a mockery towards him. Amen. So you really need to be praying about that because once we receive truth, when God showed that stuff to me, I was now accountable. And I'm going to tell you, you know, it's gotten a lot easier. But, you know, sometimes it's like, man, oh man. Like right now, I'm fighting wanting to watch a stinking Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> Charlie Brown. You know why? Because Satan attacks me with my grandkids yeah. with little memories of things we did. So, I got to be very, very cautious and have my guard up, you know. But, you know, I hope this stuff blessed you guys. I hope you have an understanding of the calendar and how God fulfilled it. And please don't let this festival of tabernacles pass you by. Rejoice. Stuff your face. Not too much. And uh, rejoice and just thank the Lord for his coming, tabernacle and dwelling among us. Okay? Amen. I love you guys. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the light of his countenance shine down upon you and give you peace, and may he create opportunities this week for you to minister the love of Christ. Jesus.